It should be recording now. Thank you. All right, everyone, I'm going to get us started because we only have a brief hour to be together this evening. So hello, nice to see many of you again and to have you with us. Uh, my name is Holly Knox. I'm the Recreation Program Manager for the Green Mountain and Finger Lakes National Forest. Thank you very much for joining us. It's not quite this evening, so I'll just say thanks for joining us this late afternoon. We are going to be talking about recreation resources, visual resources, and the heritage resources for the Telephone Gap Integrated Resource Project. I will begin the evening with the presentation, and then you will hear from Sarah Skinner, who is part of our heritage staff. And then we will also have Phil McCaskill helping us to moderate this evening. So he'll be kind of reading your questions in the chat box. Few guidelines just to remind you if you weren't, or if you were on last week, or if you were not, please keep your mic muted. This is, I just want to say, this is not because we don't want dialogue. Um, I'm really, really excited to have that dialogue on our field trip. It's because we have a, a short amount of time and we want to be respectful of everybody and try to get to as many questions as possible. So if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat box. You can see that little yellow circled chat box is how you do that. Please keep your questions focused on tonight's topics. Please keep your questions and comments respectful. And be patient if I have any technological mishaps. I, I practiced earlier today, so if you were getting any sort of feedback on the meeting, that was me just trying to see how to record it and do things. Um, I do also just wanna briefly touch a little bit on what happened at our last meeting to clarify where we're at in the NEPA process. You know, a lot of people think of the NEPA process as a triangle. You have the proposal development as one side of the triangle, you have environmental analysis as another side of the triangle, and then you have project implementation. And we are really in the proposal development phase. That's when projects are developed to respond to a need. And so think of us, we're in the brainstorming phase where we're assessing needs like how to achieve our forest plan objectives and how to respond to some of our public input or requests. It might seem odd to put this <laughs> right up front, but because Sarah is going to finish out our presentation with her own PowerPoint, I wanted to get our contacts in there and then talk about follow up meetings. So again, Holly Knox, that's my email address. Karen is our forest archaeologist who works with Sarah, so that is her email address. And then I wanted to touch on the fact that we have those follow up meetings, either meetings or field trips, and we are in the discussions right now based on last week's meeting to add a climate and carbon impacts meeting. For tonight, I did say what we're going to go through, and I, I put on here that we're going to do the question and answer session at the end. But I did say to Phil, if you put a question in the chat box that's pertinent to the slide that I'm discussing, if he can kind of read it out without us you know, bogging down the process and not being able to get through the whole presentation, I'm happy if he does that too, so we can feel more like a dialogue. All right. So I am jumping in to recreation resources. If you were on the meeting last week, you saw this slide. These are our existing recreation resources within the project area. So as I go through our projects, I want to highlight that there's a file um, tab at the top of our meeting. You can click on that to actually see the map. And there's also some links that I put in there. So I, I didn't forget to send those to you. But within the project area, we have about 140 miles of trail. We have several developed recreation sites with Lefferts being our most developed. We have some special use permit requests that are out there, and then we have other activities that are happening like dispersed camping and climbing and some of those that you see there. So tonight's when we are able to get into the meat of some of these projects. So I'm gonna jump first into our trail projects and Vellamont is the first one that I put on here. The Vellamont goal, I said this last week, it's to create an approximately 485 mile long mountain biking trail from Massachusetts to Canada. It would connect about 27 communities and have about 45 huts along the way so that people could spend the night. Backcountry skiing opportunities are along a lot of this stretch of trail as well. So through the Robinson Integrated Resource Project, that decision was signed a few years ago, we did um, approve 
15 miles of the Velamont. So through this project, we want to connect those segments to the Sherburn Trails. That's a network of uh, mountain bike trails in Killington. That would involve routes are not you know, fully developed yet. As I said, we're still in the brainstorming phase and looking at what we can and can't do, but it would be about six miles of new trail and six miles of improved trail is what we're kind of estimating. If you can see that map to the right that has kind of the, the general Bellamont route, I want to just say a disclaimer. This is not a map that is set in stone by any means. You will see that it's traversing you know, public and private property. There's definitely no commitment on any private landowner's part that this is gonna happen on these trails. So looking at making connectivity where we can between our systems. I do wanna also talk about the fact that if we would improve some of those trial trail miles some places we might look at different managed uses so the darning needle we are in discussions with different partners on that currently it's a snowmobile trail but it's been closed for a lot of years and the design standards for a snowmobile trail versus a mountain bike trail are quite different so we might just look to see if we can manage that from mountain bikes and reroute around some of the closed infrastructure being several large bridges And Phil, if I'm going too fast and chats or comments or questions are coming in, just go ahead and interrupt me. Another potential activity for trails is, um, and sorry, I realized the last slide that I probably said vast, that vast is the Vermont Association of Snow Travelers. For those who don't know, they're the statewide snowmobile organization that we work with. Um, so vast has a potential for a bypass of Wildcat Road that would be an approximate three mile bypass. And that was um, something that we talked about with our partners during the South Pond acquisition discussions. The town really expressed the importance for reducing that mixed motorized use that's occurring between cars and snowmobiles on Wildcat Road. And could that acquisition support getting snowmobiles off that road? You can see in the map to the right, the acquisition or the kind of like the peachy areas. And that um, snowmobile trail that we are proposing could move forward as part of this project is on the map that I put in the file system. Other trail activities we want to complete about a half mile of Catamount Trail improvements. There are areas where it's wet or the grade is just a little too steep, primarily wet, I should say. Those are near Route 4. We are considering decommissioning two trails. Those are the Blue Ridge Trails, or Blue Ridge Trail. That's about five miles. Uh, that's south of Wildcat Road and then Thousand Acre, which is up in Pittsfield. That is a little over a mile. Both are currently snowmobile trails. Both have had some... Um, issues with maintenance needs over the years with Thousand Acre really being washed out during Tropical Storm Irene. Blue Ridge, minor maintenance, more of a concern with um, bat and moose habitat being impacted by snow wheels. I'm gonna pause for a second just to give Phil a chance to see if there's any questions. Hi, Holly. We do have a question relating to the last slide. Uh, and the question is, would the new snowmobile route on the previous slide follow an existing road or trail or require new construction? Would the, sorry, could you repeat that? Honestly, Phil, I just stopped paying attention for a second because I'm trying to figure out how to go back a slide. This is where I ask for patience and could you repeat it? Yep. Would the new snowmobile route on the previous slide, follow an existing road or trail or require new construction? It is a mix. So the beginning of it, where it comes off of like the Lefferts Pond Trail, that would follow some existing uh, cross country ski trail, and then it would require some new trail construction. And I think I put in there the miles of new trail construction. And I'm not, Sorry, give me one second. My cursor is not letting me go back a slide and I skipped something. There we go. Okay. Any other questions? That's it so far. Okay. 
We do have a request from the Central Valley Quad Runners, which is our um, Vermont ATV Sportsmen's Association or VASA local club in the Stockbridge area. And that is for a pending acquisition of the, what we're calling the No Town or Quimby Mountain parcels. You can see that that's also in kind of that peachy color looking at that acquisition that is moving through the process right now. It has existing snowmobile and ATV trails. They do provide connection to systems that are not on the National Forest. And we have a request from that organization to consider that proposal. Couple questions, Holly. Now a follow up uh, to the previous question. Would the new trail construction require a modification to the winter travel plan? Would the new, oh, for the Bass Trail? Would the yes. Construction, consider a modification to say it again to the motor vehicle use map to the Over winter travel plan so the motor vehicle use map i think is what you are is what is being referred to subpart ooh, i think it's subpart d um i forgive me if i'm wrong and it's subpart b or c but the over snow vehicle map is something that we will be working on if it was a, a snowmobile trail edition it would be on there when we have that Great, and uh, I have a second question here. There isn't any winter parking on Forest Service Road 57, River Road where it becomes Furnace Brook Road. Parking mm -hmm. isn't allowed where the snowplow turns around. That location is near the Catamount Trail. The only other way to access this part of the trail is Brandon Gap or Mountaintop. Are there any plans to work to establish some parking there? We did not have that as part of our potential activities, but it sounds like something that we should look at and explore. So I would say, please put that comment in the chat and we'll add it to a you know, potential activity that we need to consider. All right, so Chittenden Reservoir and the camping site. So first I had some questions over email after the last meeting primarily in regards to jurisdiction and why some of the things may not have been included that the public would like to see. So I wanna talk about that first. So jurisdiction, to try to clarify, the state has jurisdiction on the water. Green Mountain Power, they own the land that's at Chittenden Reservoir and they lease it primarily most of the area to the state of Vermont as a fishing access area. The Lefferts Pond day use area and the majority of the dispersed sites and land around the lake with the exception of where there's private property, that's national forest system land. So our proposals focus on what we can do on lands where we have jurisdiction. Lefferts Pond, we did not propose to um, improve or expand parking because we already have a National Environmental Policy Act decision that approved that. That decision was signed in 2016. It includes expanding um, the parking and putting it in a slightly different location. It includes widening the road to ensure that um, emergency vehicles can have access and there's two-way traffic for the majority of it, except for that where there's a few pinch points that we couldn't. Sorry, I should go back to the parking too and say the parking would be kind of a loop and it would accommodate school buses, knowing that Barstow goes there a lot and would accommodate emergency vehicles while also acknowledging that we don't wanna have it be such a huge site that it could have um, you know, human impacts that we would not want to see if we had so much parking that it would be overrun on that site. It also includes some accessibility improvements, primarily looking at adding um, an overlook or a fishing pier to the Lefferts Pond side of things. If you know that site, if you go um, past the access to Chittenden Reservoir and you have the dam in front of you to the right, there's a large mode area. It would be in that area. So those are not part of the proposal. They are already approved. But we wanna make sure that continued access for boating is at Chittenden Reservoir. Now for the dispersed camping sites, this is where we, I'll be honest, we have a lot of conversations and there's a lot of debate about what's best. So we really, really wanna hear from the public. And if I don't hear a lot of, um, Concerns for other field trip locations, this is probably the one that would be at the top of my list. The options that we have really talked about and we're open to other ideas. One, no change. That means that we would you know, continue to have dispersed camping allowed there, but we 
would not have a ton of management oversight as far as going in and removing high risk trees because we don't do that at our dispersed sites where we do do that at developed recreation sites. We go in and clean up trash, but not nearly as frequently as we do for our developed recreation sites. So that would be um, a no change option. We also have the option of designating a formal campground. That gives us a few different options that we could take and we don't have to take both, but we could have reservation possibilities. I talked about that at the last meeting that we hear from a number of people who have concerns that you, you know, pack up everything to go camping, you put it in your canoe, you get out there and your favorite site is gone. So potential for reservations, also potential for fees. Most of our campgrounds are in the $15 range per night. With designating a campground comes what I just talked about, that we would be managing more for high risk trees, potential to have a host on site. If we had fees, it could help us bring in dollars to address waste management a bit better. Another option is to have um, what we call concentrated use areas. Those would be low level, but designated sites that would just enable us to kind of keep, keep the area and the camping options similar to what is now, but they would be designated that we could put our recreation dollars um, more to those sites. So those are our, our options that we have been thinking about there. I'm going to pause in case anybody has questions. Well, there's nothing in chat, Holly. OK. All right, so we are thinking about a couple of different things for Deer Leap. Really, we have heard the picture, if you can see that, the red circles are three different signs um, that are happening there. So we really realize that we need to have a look at what the signage and the wayfinding is at that site. There's a lot of concerns about people going where they shouldn't onto private property or where they don't think they're going and then end up um, trying to climb up the face and having a lot of need for, for rescue from Killington folks. So we want to take a, a hard look at that area and what we can do differently. South Pond, when that parcel becomes National Forest System land, we have had a request to have a hut as part of that Vellamont hut to hut system. And snowmobile parking has also been brought up by a partner. So we want to see, we know it's very challenging in the Chittenden area where the fishing access area does not necessarily allow just for vast trail access. Um, and then the upper Michigan is a parking lot that we have. Is it ample for access to the vast trail network? Holly, we do have a question relating to the previous slide. Uh, when you consider fees, uh, are you talking about camping fees or parking fees? So the Forest Service does not charge for parking fees. Um, we don't have authority to even do that. We are talking about camping fees. And there are, I should say certain, it's funny, I paused because I was waiting for somebody to say something back, but you're all just putting it in the chat, sorry. Um, we do have to provide certain amenities. We have different types of fees that we can charge. And I'm not talking dollar amounts. I'm talking about the authority to charge those fees. Putting it on a reservation system is one reason that we can charge a fee. Right, and Kelly, just to speak to that a little bit, when there's what seems like a parking fee, that would be more like an entrance fee or a use fee. If you see that on other uh, forests, it, it we would not consider it a parking fee. That is correct. So it might be a fee to access a specialized trail system. It might be a fee because where you are parking is a developed recreation site that provides certain amenities. So it usually has to provide trash, a toilet, um, reasonable, about, reasonable amount of visitor protection, whether that's forest protection officers. So yes, it's not, you would not be paying just for parking. And one more here, Holly. It looks like it might be a little more of a comment. Uh, Love to see a side trail from the base of the new Boston Trail to the North Pond Trail following the former Green Road. There is a snowmobile trail now. This is an historic area, and this would also allow a loop hike with the Long Trail and the new Boston Trail. Plus, it includes a nice viewpoint. The former Zeeb Green Tavern Foundation is 
near the Green Brook Road on the former Green Road. Thank you to that commenter, and I would love to have that put on a map so we can see exactly what you're talking about, but I appreciate that comment. We'll have to look into it. If it doesn't say in the comment, it would be nice to know too if the commenter is asking for what, what type of trail, so hiking, snowmobile, what they're looking for. So last of my recreation slide before we go to visuals, and this is just talking about different opportunities that we would explore for dispersed recreation. So I mentioned that backcountry skiing is something that people, I didn't mention it. I mentioned it at the last meeting, sorry. Backcountry skiing is something that people are interested in, um, particularly in the South Pond acquisition area. And could that um, be a possibility there? Our upper Michigan dispersed sites, we talked about this before too, that we would like to boulder off some of the extraneous access points that are having some erosion issues. Some of the trails that we are aware of, we know that there's definitely some unauthorized trails by our supervisor's office that's being constructed in Menden. Want to look into those and see how we can work with those users to make sure that people aren't constructing trails where they should not and that we can put to bed those unauthorized. And then the Killington Pit, we want to just monitor that berm and see if we are seeing a reduction in trash and make sure that we're not seeing any impacts to the soil in that area. Moving to visuals, I will say that for the one, visual, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Polly. Uh, one question here, it says, are there currently specific alternatives you are looking at for the use of the Killington range? Will you consider looking at public safety? How, how use currently coexists with the growth and use of the Sherburn trails and environmental impacts from the lead and other items deposited currently and over the years? Yes, to answer that question, we are looking at all of those issues, particularly um, our hydrology and soil staff are interested in what the impacts potentially are from the lead that's been left at the site. Um, we are looking at the challenges in that area, knowing that there's a lot of people who are using trail systems and making sure that safety is accounted for. We have hiked behind there to see how far some of those shots are going. Um, so yes, we are considering a lot of those concerns while also acknowledging that public lands are open to shooting. This is not a range. I think that when you said that, Phil, the comment might have been written as though this were a range. This is what we would just call the general forest area. Um, it just happens to be an area that was previously disturbed, allowing people to go there and have that long distance sight line for target shooting. And then one more here, Holly, before you leave for visuals, would you speak to some of your thoughts on Friends of the Chittenden Reservoir? Yes. <laughs> Did Kelly say that? <laughs> um, so it is something that we have been very interested in, and I, I appreciate the tickler for my my little pitch here. Friends of Chittenden Reservoir. Chittenden Reservoir is just a, it's a beautiful water body um, that reminds me a lot of Green, Res Green River Reservoir, where a lot of locals know about it, but it's not even clear to everybody from the public what you can and can't do there. And then because of that, I think sometimes when people go out and they are doing activities, if they think that they're hiding, they might not be as respectful as they should. So Friends of Chittenden Re Reservoir, we would love to have an organization that adopts the dispersed sites really, um, that could help us go out you know, once a week, once every couple of weeks, monitor for trash, make public contacts if people feel comfortable doing that and really just help with a site that is pretty far from our office not too far for us to go there but a challenge when it, you have to take a boat to get out to all the sites and the time that that can take from forest service staff we have a limited recreation staff so we would really just love some support i will just also add typically with groups like that we will meet with you be strong supporters but it would be kind of um a public led effort to, to manage and organize that group. All right, 
So moving to visuals, and then there can be comments and questions at the end too for recreation. We are looking to maintain or enhance vistas within the project area. We also want to ensure that when other project activities are moved from the you know, potential project into an analysis phase for the project development that we want to ensure visuals are protected. Maintaining and enhancing vistas may include debrushing, removing some trees that have grown up into existing just to enhance those visuals. So if you can see the sites, if not, the link is in the chat box where you can go to all of our documents and you can see this in the landscape assessment. But if you know of uh, existing vistas that we should highlight, I know that one was mentioned earlier in that potential new trail, then let me know. I will go to the second page as well. And I specifically wanted to say that it's also protecting that view shed because when you see the mountaintop port porch, no, we are not proposing to do anything to the mountaintop porch. We just want to make sure that what they can see from some of these locations too that we protect. I can pass the slideshow to Sarah. So she can talk about heritage resources and then I'm happy to answer questions at the end. All right, I think once you stop sharing, I'll be able to share my screen. All right, let's see. Just gotta find my PowerPoint, all right. To the person that mentioned Chittenden boat launch. Uh, uh, the Chittenden boat ramp is actually uh, managed by the state of Vermont. That's on state land. If that was a question, yes, it's actually Green Mountain Power Land, but the state leases it. Uh, Holly, a uh, little add on there, uh, mentioning the visual from Chittenden boat, boat launch. Oh, thank you. All right, Holly, can you see my PowerPoint up? I can. Okay, perfect. <laughs> All right, um, my name is Sarah Skinner. I am an archeologist with the Green Mountain National Forest. Um, I kind of work under Karen, who's on the call here today. She is the Her Heritage Program Manager. Um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about um, what we do as heritage specialists. Um, essentially, we're responsible for managing, protecting, preserving, and interpreting the archaeological sites that are on the National Forest. Um, part of that is um, how do we protect these resources is we identify um, these sites. Um, whenever there is a project that's being um, implemented, we have to go out there and make sure that any ground disturbing activities is reviewed and that they're not going to be affecting any of our resources. So we generally do that doing survey, we do shovel testing, and we flag our resources for protection. So a lot of our work is kind of, you know, with timber projects, with rec projects, with watershed projects, where we're wanting to get out there and protect the resources before any um, work is actually done on the ground. Um, in terms of the telephone gap um, project area, there are 76 known archaeological sites in that area. And that's information that we have gathered over the years, um, sites that we found um, from just research or going out on projects. Um, there's also a potential for another 26 sites to be found. Um, and that information we collect from old maps, um, from LIDAR data that we look at on GIS. And those are areas we try and go out to when there's a project proposed. We wanna go and make sure that we visit our confirmed sites, but also check the locations where there's the potential for archeological resources. Um, I just threw a map on here on the left of LIDAR. Um, that's kind of what we use to find a lot of the historic sites on the forest, like old farmsteads. and this is great data for showing old roads, old trails, and we're able to identify rock walls, rock piles, cellar holes, foundations, and we kind of use that as um, a basis to start our survey when going out to survey for a project. 
Hey, Sarah, your yes. slides aren't advancing. Oh, man. All right. You're also not in presentation mode e either for some reason. You're, it's just like we can. There you go. Now you're on the right slide. But I'm not in presentation mode yet. No, we can see like the slide menu on the side. That's all. We can see it clearly. All if right. you click the little screen with the arrow at the top and your orange bar, do you see that? Go up, go left, left, go left. Yeah. There you go. Hmm. Is that still small for you? Yep. Well. <laughs> what about if you click that enable editing button? That sometimes can seize stuff up. All right. Sorry yes. for the technical difficulties. <laughs> Okay. Sarah, I'm guessing you're sharing a different screen. Like, make sure you're sharing this screen with the presentation on it. Okay, let me spend just a second trying this, and if not, I'll just show the smaller screen. <laughs> OK, I'm not sure I know how to make it bigger. I mean, it is larger on my screen, but I guess not for you. Okay, Sorry, I'll just go through the smaller slides <laughs> unless someone else wants to share this for me. All right, do you see the slide with the LiDAR image on it? Yes. OK, I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> Um, so this is the LiDAR image I was talking about that we look at um, when going out to survey for sites. Um, it, these images are useful for showing uh, old roads, old rock walls. I guess I have my cursor now that you might be able to see, um, as well as cellar hole foundations and barn foundations. And if anyone wants to view the slide, you're welcome to email me and I can send you the slide <laughs> if you want to see the pictures closer up. Um, so some of the projects that we try to um, implement within these larger IRP boundaries um, are volunteer projects, because um, typically a lot of our time is spent reviewing projects that are proposed within that area. We do also want to take time to get out to some of these sites and make sure that we're maintaining them and that they're not becoming overgrown. Um, so cemetery maintenance is one of the big ones that we've drawn in volunteers for. Uh, we have a lot of family plots on the forest. So not large cemeteries, just small farmstead family plots. And our cleaning that we do normally just involves straightening the gravestones as well as clearing the brush around them. Um, so the images you can kind of see, I know they're small on your screen on the left. The top one is a before image and the bottom one is an after image of the Dutton Cemetery. And um, this is just kind of getting these weeds and small brush um, and trees out of the way so that it, it doesn't further deteriorate the site. And volunteers are normally drawn from historical societies, um, from the Vermont Archaeological Society and other members of the public to help. Other projects on a similar scale with volunteers um, are brush removal around archaeological sites. Uh, there's a lot of 19th century farmsteads that have become overgrown, specifically like the barn foundations and cellar holes. Um, tree growth that occurs within those sites end up kind of slumping the walls of cellar holes and they'll destroy and displace the rocks of the foundations. So we like to try and get out to sites that have really become overgrown and get them cleared out. And this year, um, again, this is a before and after picture. The top is before. The bottom is after and we had the VYCC crew come and help us with the Pierce Tavern up in Ripton, Vermont to clear out one of the cellar holes that was becoming really overgrown. Um, and this cellar hole will actually be right along a trail that's being um, placed in near the Robert Frost um, interpretive trail. 
One of the, well, let's get the slide to show. Uh, one of the sites that's within the Telephone Gap Project area is um, a gravestone. Um, what's interesting about this gravestone is it has no words on it, so we're not sure exactly who is there or how old the gravestone is. Um, but this is one of the sites that we would want to get volunteers to help us kind of clear some of the brush, a lot of the dead debris around the site. In the top image, it's hard to see the gravestone in the center there, um, but a large dead tree had fallen and knocked it out of place a little. So one thing we would want to do is go out there and straighten it up and also remove all that debris around it. Um, and then the bottom picture is just a, a cool design that was on the gravestone. There was no words on it, but it, there is a design of a willow tree, which helps us date it to possibly the late 18th to early 19th century. And, you know, one question that's always asked from us is how can you guys be notified of these opportunities? And we always contact the Vermont Archaeological Society of projects that we're when we're accepting volunteers. So I highly encourage joining their newsletter um, so that you know of opportunities that pop up on the National Forest and other places in Vermont. Um, but in September, it's Vermont Archaeology Month, and we do try to have a project, or not project, but an event that we host within one of our IRPs that we can take volunteers and show them some sites or get their help on cleaning up the site. So I know that was kind of fast, um, and I'm sorry that the PowerPoint did not show at the correct size, um, but I'm going to send this back to you, Holly. <laughs> Sarah, don't, don't go too far yet. We've okay. got uh, a question. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Could you please provide or please describe the communication interaction that you or other staff have had with members of the Abenaki community while developing this project? Yeah, of course. Um, so we always notify the Abenaki community of projects that are planning on being implemented. Typically within the planning phase, um, we haven't discussed any proposals yet for the Telephone Gap IRP. Um, but one thing that I know that we've had interest in from the Abenaki communities is working on our signs. Um, and that's one thing I'm hoping that we can do with them is to update some of our signs to kind of get the knowledge um, about the area out to the public. Sarah, off the hot seat, Bill. All right. Well, thank you, Sarah. One, one more, Holly. Uh, I believe Honto's Cave is within this project area, but maybe on private land. Any chance you folks might be thinking about how to include this site important to Chittenden? Um, I have not taken the time to look yet at uh, sites on private land. I did notice when I was reading about the Chittenden area that there are two or three or even more caves. Um, and that's something that we can look into. But when it's on private land, it then gets difficult. We'll need to contact whoever it is that has it. Um, but it would be interesting to go out to see because it would be great to record the site. All right, so that concludes the presentation piece of tonight. So we would just be looking to fill out the remainder of our time together with questions. Looks like we have answered everything in the chat. I see one is coming in, so we'll wait for that one and then we'll give people a couple minutes. Will this presentation recording be available as the overall presentation was made available on YouTube? Um, 
Yes, I believe that to be the case that it will be available. I could defer to Chris Matrick if he wants to answer that. And if not, then we'll say with yes, we think so. <laughs> yes, yes, it will be. <laughs> Thank you. Would campsite registration be an online app? You know, that is a great question. We really talked a lot about how the reservation system could work. To answer part of that question, yes, our reservations are done through recreation.gov. So we have a national system that you would make the reservation. It does include a small additional fee when you make a reservation. How to manage it at the site is honestly something that we have kind of scratched our heads over because you aren't going to be typically when we have reservations at a campground, you have a board that you write down the dates that it is reserved. So short of having a host or a Friends of Chittenden Reservoir who can help us manage that, you know, we talked about could you have kind of a, a, a box where people flip the tags and say if the site's reserved, knowing that somebody could always flip all the tags. Um, so we've really contemplated how to do that and we are open to your suggestions. Wondering about the possible parking solutions you're considering for access to vast trails. It is a good question because in the past we have looked at Wildcat Road and there's just um, not a lot of space there that we could provide it. We have talked about the potential of at Lefferts Pond if we improve that and it's wide enough to where you could actually have snowmobile trailers pull around in there. Is that something that our partners or the town would be willing to help us maintain in the winter? We Typically don't have a plowing contract. We do a lot of plowing with our staff and that would just be a real challenge to get there and keep it plowed and maintain all winter long. So we'd be looking to some outside support for that. Also looking at Upper Michigan, could we expand that? Is that where you really need it? That lot does not seem to be full except for at you know peak perfect days. So I think it's discussions to be had on exactly where that could happen. Those were the two that we have discussed to date. And then above that, Holly, was uh, how do you assess the impacts to wildlife from recreational trails? Yep. So when I talked about that NEPA triangle at the beginning, once we get into the assessment and analysis phase, we have wildlife biologists who really run that analysis to kind of look at what those impacts might be. And then along that same line, has there been any analysis of designation or management for remote slash wilderness characteristics as part of the planning process? Has there been any analysis of designation for management? Uh, well, first of all, we have not done any analysis yet. We are you know, developing the proposal. So to answer the question in short, it would be no, there has not been any analysis. Um, but yes, when we do the analysis, we will consider impacts uh, to character. We look at different th different program areas, look at different types of impacts. We look at from the recreation opportunity spectrum. Wilderness is not within the project area. Um, but yes, as part of the analysis, I'm trying to see the bottom part of that question. Oh, as the planning process goes on. Yes, we will. And then last question here in the chat for now. What considerations are you working on to ensure the rec sites are, are not subject to overuse that would degrade the overall environment? Mm -hmm. So a lot of that is looking at you know site design, including, and we talked earlier about how big of a parking lot do we make at Lefferts. You want to have it within the site's carrying capacity. So you're talking about you know, how many people can be at a site that they don't get pushed to the point where they have to start making you know, their own trails because there's so many people who are on the existing trails or they don't start making their own little um, side places to hang out because there's not enough places for the people to disperse and enjoy the site without being on top of each other. So parking helps to limit it. Um, trying to see where the question is going if you're thinking i'm thinking that kelly was thinking about lefferts area uh, but in general um it's a lot of site design on 
our part to just try to disperse the use and to manage people, whether it's through enforcement patrols, um, having volunteers who are helping us when we are finding issues, then we try to address those quickly so they don't blossom. Um, so, yes. Holly, I assume the assessment includes air quality and noise pollution, question mark. The bowl that forms the reservoir poses some challenges. I'm going to, can I pass to you, Chris? Or Jay? Or Sean? I don't know if Sean's there. I'm phoning a friend. Chris, did you hear the yeah, question? No, I, I, you phoned a friend. I just, I, I was not um, paying full attention when Phil asked the question, so. No problem. They're looking to see, will it include an assessment about air quality and noise pollution, particularly because the, the bowl around the res reservoir could be have impacts? There, there will be an analysis of air quality and sound as, and, and, and air as part, as part of the NEPA analysis. There typically is a, at least a short section on that as part of the NEPA analysis. Thank you. And one. comment that bears saying out loud as a follow up uh, to an earlier question, please consider rewilding alternative and an alternative for areas that include intact forests. And I assume that has to do with the uh, question above having to do with trails. And Glenn, uh, can you just explain what rewilding means to you? Oh, yeah, in the chat. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> or Glenn, you can definitely email me. You have my email address. I would love to hear just more of what you're thinking by in that comment. Give it a few minutes too. I do just want to say thank you. Thank you all for being respectful, for listening, for having great ideas, for knowing that we're we're really just trying to work with you to create the best possible project. This is where we ask the district ranger to do a dance routine at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see if you're yeah, you, you don't want to see me dance. Um, I, yeah, I'm looking at Glenn's question. I went back up and I looked at his, him. Um, Glenn's question previously, it didn't seem really directly related to trails. So what I'm I'm viewing that Glenn is is that you know will would we consider a rewilding alternative as an alternative, one of the alternatives in the NEPA analysis for areas that, that include intact forests, and we would certainly take that under consideration and would consider that as part of an alternative, if um, you know if the re resource supported that. Thank you. I think we may be giving everybody back 10 more minutes of your evening. I think that's it. I'm not seeing anybody chiming in. Um, you do always have access to our emails. We are here to serve you, so please let me know if you have comments or suggestions. Oh, incoming scheduling. Good to know for follow-up meetings. That's good feedback that maybe this isn't the best time for folks. Zach, you're teasing us. <laughs> oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you all for coming. All right, I think that's it. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks for attending, everyone. We really appreciate the input.